be handy for you and for me if you could have John chapter 18 handy in front of you. And as we come to it, let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, the focus of our Bible probe this evening is Simon Peter. But we need, I think, first of all, to note the background to his denials of knowing the Lord Jesus. It's a complex religious situation that confronts us. So just let me briefly try and unravel it as we look at verses 12 to 14, which say, then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Well, that's fairly straightforward until you reach verses 19 to 24, because in 19 and 22, Annas is spoken of as being the high priest. What's said there is what he said. And then in verse 24, Annas sends Jesus off to the high priest. So we seem to have two high priests. Caiaphas and his father-in-law, Annas. So what's that all about? Well, Old Testament Israel was a theocracy. That is, it was ruled by God and its constitution was God's law, which the priests were to teach and enforce. It had a monarchy for just over 400 years of its history, but those days had long gone. So in effect, the clergy ruled, or would have done if the Romans hadn't invaded the land and taken it over. And number one in the priesthood of Israel was the high priest. Annas had actually been high priest from AD 6 to 15, when he'd been deposed by Pilate's predecessor as governor of Judea. That move had not been popular among the Jews, so Annas retained a lot of unofficial clout. Many still looked to him as their high priest. After all, it was a job for life, and the Jews didn't approve of a foreign pagan power appointing its own high priest. And so Annas was the power behind the official high priest. Caiaphas would probably have to go along with his father-in-law or risk public disapproval. And so Jesus is brought before Annas first in verse 13, and Caiaphas, the official high priest, has to wait his turn till verse 24. The trial before Annas from verse 19 is a phony trial. It raises all manner of questions as to its legality. It was a trial that took place late at night the prisoner being denied sleep. He was not given any defense witnesses or lawyers for his defense. For the judge's aim here was to get the prisoner to implicate himself, as he seemed to have no valid charge to level against him. Jesus refused to walk into that trap and suggested that they might like to trawl the crowds who'd heard him teach publicly for the evidence that they're looking for. And so one of the officials present, recognizing the put down to Annas, slapped Jesus in the face. This is no just or official trial. It's a kangaroo court led by an old man trying to cling on to power. Jesus faced a lynch mob, but it got Jesus' enemies nowhere. And so Annas sent Jesus off for an official Jewish trial before the official high priest, about which John shows no interest at all. His one interest in Caiaphas, as shown in verse 14, is a prophecy the high priest had made. At verse 14, Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. 
So let's go back to that advice in chapter 11 for a mo, as John focuses on it. Chapter 11, and uh, we'll come in at verse 47. The hierarchy in Israel is at this point very concerned about Jesus' impact. So verse 47, then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He didn't say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. That's Jesus' life. So the Jewish religious top brass are worried, aren't they, by the Lord Jesus. The crowds love him. His miraculous signs are undeniable. If left alone, he could cause huge unrest across the nation, which would threaten the status quo. So prompt action needed to be taken. We must get rid of this man, Jesus, because if he creates a big enough stir, the Romans are going to move in on us and curtains. Notice four things about these words of Caiaphas. Number one, John tells us that, verse 51, Caiaphas' words were not his own. Being the nation's high priest that year, God spoke through him. Now, that doesn't mean Caiaphas was a godly man in tune with his maker. He was anything but that. He was no more in tune with God than the false prophet Balaam was. But God isn't limited as to who he speaks through, is he? So Caiaphas did not speak from himself. The Bible is simply waking us up to take seriously what he says here. His prophecy that Jesus would die for others was God-given. Second thing we ought to note about Caiaphas' words is that they were pragmatic. What prompted him to say what he did? In a word, self-interest. Caiaphas was not arguing from a deep sense of God's purpose. Caiaphas was a politician. And he's arguing for whatever needed to be done in order to retain power. He was not saying that Jesus was guilty of a capital offence that needed punishing. His argument was solely utilitarian. <coughs> we who are in charge of the nation, though of course they weren't, can't afford to have anyone rocking the boat. If we're seen not to be in control, our power will be taken from us and who knows where it will end. Better to shed one man's blood than give the Romans cause to have a bloodbath. The end justifies the means. One man's grief will save widespread terror. Third thing about Caiaphas's words are they are ironic. You see, there is truth in what Caiaphas was saying. On his lips, it was immoral and unjust truth, but it was nevertheless true. This one man, Jesus, was to die for the nation and for a whole lot more than that nation. Jesus did not die for himself. He came to die for us all. The irony is that the man who was heading up an assassination attempt on Jesus, for from that day on they plotted to take Jesus' life, was doing far more than he understood or was aware of. Jesus would die for Gentiles as well as Jews, for God's people scattered across the world from all nations. Caiaphas may only have been thinking of maintaining peaceful relations with his pagan conquerors, but he was saying far more than he knew. 
Which brings us to our fourth point, that Caiaphas' words were substitutionary. What was on the high priest's mind was that one man should suffer instead of the whole nation. No, he hadn't grasped the point that Jesus would die in place of sinners to save them from God's wrath by taking their sin on himself. Here is the high priest of Israel intent on murdering Jesus and explaining that such a death would be substitutionary. It would save a whole lot of other people getting butchered by the Roman authorities. He could, of course, have found it if he'd read his scriptures, couldn't he? Do you remember the call of the prophet Isaiah 700 years earlier about someone who would take our pain, bear our suffering, be pierced for our transgressions, be crushed for our iniquities, whose punishment would bring us peace, on whom the Lord would lay the iniquity of us all? So although the leader of Israel was basically trying to save his own skin, if Jesus led an uprising against the Romans, he spoke more than he knew, didn't he? For who actually killed Jesus? So easy, isn't it, from our place in history to read the narrative of what actually took place then and pin the blame on the likes of Annas and Caiaphas the Roman governor and the traitor Judas Iscariot, as though, of course, we'd never do a thing like that, would we? But John is implicitly asking a bigger question as to who was responsible for the death of Jesus. Remember Caiaphas's prophecy? As high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the separated children of God, to bring them together and make them one. See, the question is not ultimately about who did what on that dreadful Passover festival. The question is as to what lies behind it. Is there more to it than what the participants engineered and did in getting rid of Jesus out of envy, jealousy, hatred? Actually, it was God's plan that his much-loved son should die at the hands of evil human beings as a substitute for the sins of the whole world. There's a sense in which, you see, each of us are implicated in the death of Jesus. A 19th century hymn writer puts it like this. He asks... Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon you? It is my treason, Lord, that has undone you. And I, oh Jesus, it was I denied you. I crucified you. See how the shepherd for the sheep is offered. The slave has sinned, and yet the son has suffered. For our atonement hangs the Saviour bleeding, God interceding. It was our sins that took Jesus to that cross. It was our sins he bore there and paid for there. Oh, he did it voluntarily, of course. No one took his life. We'll hear Jesus putting the Roman judge right on that score if we read on through the chapter. But it isn't the Jews who are the Christ slayers, is it? It's you and me too. And God looks to us to make a response to that great reality. What are the Bible's terms for that forgiveness? Their words are repentance and faith. What do they mean? Repentance means agreeing with God about how bad our sinfulness is. It means hating the sins that sent Jesus to the cross and asking God's power to resist them. It means turning around from running away from God to running to him for forgiveness and welcome. And faith means gladly accepting that when Jesus died on that cross, 
it was for my sins, my wrongs, for my heart rebellion against my maker, about my refusal to have Jesus run my life. It means trusting Jesus alone as my rescuer from well-deserved punishment from God when I front up to him on the last day. Christ died for all. The big question is, what will each of us do about him? Well, let's come back to John 18 and to Simon Peter. As with no doubt the writer of this gospel account, he follows Jesus and his captors out of Gethsemane to the residence of the high priest. Let's pick up the narrative again at verse 15. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I'm not. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Do you remember what Judas was doing in verse 5? He'd come with a band of people to arrest Jesus, and he was standing with them, not with Jesus. What's Peter doing? He's standing with them too. Jesus' trial before Annas over, we pick up the storyline at verse 25. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself, so they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. What is it about Simon Peter? I was going to say he was a lovable rogue, but he was no rogue, was he? He wasn't devious or sneaky. He was a very straightforward person. If there's something Peter had up to this very moment, it had been fierce loyalty to Jesus. He'd even taken on those who'd come to arrest Jesus in the defense of his master. He was the only one who drew a sword to do that. It was an incredibly stupid thing he did, of course, but it was an act of devotion. Peter was an impetuous fellow, a larger-than-life character who would stand out, I think, in any room at the party. He was the person who instinctively spoke up for everyone else. He had a big heart, he had a ready tongue. He was the first to recognize who Jesus was and the first to give him a piece of his mind. <laughs> He's the guy who spoke up on the Mount of Transfiguration because he didn't know what to say. But Peter's now facing a crisis. Things have not turned out as Peter had expected. He'd once boldly claimed that Jesus would never suffer at the hands of Israel's leaders, that he would never be killed by his enemies. And now it was all happening, as Jesus said it would, but as Peter said it wouldn't. <laughs> and Peter is rightly nervous. The surroundings might well have made him feel intimidated. His colleague was well known to the high priest family and seemed quite at home in the courtyard of their house. Not so Peter. Perhaps wondering if someone would recognize him as the person who gave one of the servants more than earache. However, it's not an official, is it, with bulging biceps who first accosts Peter. It was a servant girl who asked a simple and obvious question. She'd seen Peter come in with someone known to be a follower of Jesus. She rightly assumed Peter would be one as well. 
It's doubtful, I think, that she intended to be threatening, though she may have been a little cynical because of Jesus' present position. But Peter dogmatically claims he's no follower of Jesus. And so as the night got colder and the fire more necessary for warding off the shivers, those standing round put the same question to Peter and got the same reply. And then, as almost seemed inevitable, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a cock began to grow, crow. Jesus is Lord, isn't he, even over cockerels? <laughs> But why mention that? An awful lot of things were happening just then. The scene would have been a very noisy one in the courtyard of the high priest, but there is one noise above that of the human commotion in that courtyard John wants to point out to us. The sound of a rooster starting his dawn chorus. Well, that's more than fascinating, isn't it? John is taking us back to the end of chapter 13. The disciples are still with Jesus in the upper room, well away from the threatening plans being finalized, just a little way off. And here's the last two verses of chapter 13. Peter asks, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Peter answered, will you, uh, Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Hmm. Well, here's Peter, I think, as we know and love him, a man who's so dedicated to his friend and leader that he, he vows to do everything he can for the cause, even if it means death. Lord, I will lay down my life for you. Isn't that the image we like to project on Sundays? Well away from those who intimidate us, we indulge in that sort of bravado, don't we? Singing words like, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, or to defend his cause, maintain the honour of his word, the glory of his cross. Will that be us tomorrow morning? Will that be how it is when we're out there? And a girl in reception takes the rise out of us when our colleagues make fun of us for spending Sunday the way that we do. A while ago, I was in Belmarsh prison for a Bible study with vulnerable prisoners. And as we arrived at the room where we met, an officer scoffed across the passageway. He called them any number of less than kind things that I can't repeat and said he'd give a five pound note to any of them who didn't go into the Bible study. They'd also, of course, take stick when they got back to their wing, their cell, and yet each one quietly proceeded into the study. See, Peter isn't going red in the face because someone's taking the mickey for him being so delinquent as to be a follower of Jesus. He's thinking, my master's been defeated by his enemies. He's got a one-way ticket to crucifixion. They'll come looking for me next and for my fellow disciples. You see, within the circle and safety of his band of brothers, Peter could afford to play the big man, can't he? Who could contradict his foolish claim to be loyal even to death, even if the rest of them were a bunch of wimps? <laughs> but Peter simply didn't have a clue, did he? He was clueless about why Jesus was about to die. He was clueless about his own weakness. He was thoroughly self-deceived. Not so Jesus. He knew where he was going and why. He knew he was going to a cross to prepare a place in glory for his true followers. He even knew that the rooster wouldn't start up the next morning before Peter had denied him three times. 
His maths were a lot better than mine. But Peter thought that Jesus couldn't do it without him. He would be his loyal supporter, come what may. And so we have that ironic claim from Peter's lips, I will lay down my life for you. He simply didn't understand that his master and Lord had come to lay down his life for Peter. Hadn't Jesus already told them that's what would happen? I am the good shepherd, he'd said. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I know that sounds bizarre. What are a flock of sheep to do if they're without their shepherd? <laughs> Seems crazy, doesn't it, on the surface? You'd want to say to Jesus, hang about a minute, um, doesn't quite make sense to me. What are the sheep going to do? But Peter didn't have a clue that it was only the sinless Jesus who could lay down his life for anyone. Peter didn't understand his own frailty. Is that like you? Is that like me? Peter was deeply self-deceived. We don't like to think of ourselves that way, but our hearts are desperately deceitful, aren't they? We can be one thing on a Sunday and something very different tomorrow. Depends on the company we're in. We think we know what we would do in a particular set of circumstances, but we don't know ourselves as we think we do. Peter thought he knew himself. He knew what he would do. Lord, I'll lay down my life for you. But when the chips were down, it was different, wasn't it? Paul, one of Jesus' chief spokesmen, warns us like this. He says, if you think you're standing firm, be careful you don't fall. Mm -hmm. Such self-confidence in a Christian is crazy, isn't it? We ought to know ourselves from God and his word. Your continued loyalty to the Lord Jesus will not be down to you ultimately, to your strength, to your prowess, to your spirituality. If the most loyal and courageous of apostles is brought down by a servant girl, don't think for a moment that you and I couldn't be. Hmm? The church is a community of failing people. That's why we don't talk about church, do we? We talk about the Lord Jesus. We proclaim him. He's the only person worth talking about. Peter and his colleagues stand out in contrast to him. They all failed. Jesus never did. Never will. So Peter's a great warning to us, isn't he, against overconfidence? against cowardice, against proud stupidity. Here we find the bravest of the 12 crumbling before servants by disowning his Lord and chief, categorically, without any doubt in his voice. But the comfort to us is that it is none other than Peter the Apostle who not only dropped a clangor three times publicly, but the same Simon Peter who found forgiveness. When the Lord Jesus looked across at Peter when that ro 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 rooster crowed, that look broke Peter down because it was not a look of anger. It wasn't a dismissive look. It was a look that showed that Jesus still cared for him. That far from writing Peter off, Jesus alive from the dead looks him out personally and restores him and entrusts him with the huge responsibilities and privileges of making Jesus known. You see, though Peter boasted about laying down his life for Jesus, it was Jesus who laid down his life for Peter to buy his forgiveness and pardon. Isn't the last chapter of this 
gospel document, wonderful. As the Lord, well, he interrogates Simon Peter, and he does so in front of all the others, but he not only says, Peter, do you love me? He says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, look after my sheep. You say, what? A man like this? A man who's publicly denied you three times, you want him to be a shepherd of your flock? In Acts chapter 3, Peter is preaching to those who had accused him. And uh, this is what he says to them. He says, you know what your trouble is? He says, you denied, you disowned the holy and righteous one. And I'm thinking, hang about, didn't you do that three times yourself? <laughs> it's gone. It's finished. It's forgiven. Peter, unlike Judas, he repents. He's broken by the look of Jesus. And so he comes back in repentance and faith. And he's restored and he's given a place of great responsibility among the people of God. Our Lord is so very gracious, isn't he? He's so very merciful. I look back over my life and think of innumerable times when I've messed up, when I've got it wrong, when I've acted wrongly. And in the mercy of God, <clears throat> in each case, he's brought me back and given me work to do for him. Our failures are not good. Let's not make excuses for them. But the great thing we get from Simon Peter is our failures may be real, but they do not need to be final. It's no good. Here I am, a sinner saved by grace. And as I sin and come back, I find he is faithful to me. And he is just because another has already taken those failures and sins on himself on a cross. And as God looks at me, he doesn't see a single one of them. And he welcomes me back as I confess them. And he even generously gives me work to do. What we tend to do as children of Adam is to try and deny our failures rather than face them, especially when other people are around. But if we are disciples of this great master, we can face our failures because they don't have to be the last word. We don't have to say, I've blown it. Now Jesus won't want anything to do with me. We can come back to him and confess our sin and know that he faithfully forgives and restores. Forgiveness is what Jesus won for us at the cross. He came here specifically to die for Peter's failures, for my failures, for yours. Jesus laid down his life for the man who recklessly promised to lay down his life for Jesus. Like Peter, there may well be times when we have to go out and weep bitterly over our sins, our failures. But we need not do it in bitterness or despair. The Christian message is for failures like me. Peter's failures were forgiven because he was forgiven. Have your failures been forgiven? Have you been personally forgiven by this Lord Jesus? That's what he really went to the cross to achieve. However little Caiaphas and Peter understood it at the time. Let's pray. Father and God, you are holy, holy, holy. We sinful creatures can not even dare to look on you. You dwell in light, 
unapproachable. And yet, Lord, your love for us has been shown in all its enormity at the cross of your Son. In order that we might be forgiven, in order that our failures and sins might be written off forever from your records, the cost was that great. God, who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? And so tonight, Lord, we bring ourselves to you with all our deficiency. We confess it all to you. We ask your Spirit's help not to repeat it. And Lord, we thank you that we can know we are forgiven. We can know that there is not a mention of our wrongs in your books at all, that you buried them in the deepest sea. As far as the east is from the west, so far you've removed them from us. Not one sticks to our name. And all because of Jesus. And all because of the cross. So, Lord, as we go out into this week and live at times less than perfect, Lord, let us not give up on you. Let us not write ourselves off because you have not written us off you've come to our desperate need and you've met it in jesus your son so send us on our way tonight we pray confident confident christians that our faith rests not in our actions but in what our savior has done Thank you that he intercedes for us here and now, puts his self between you and us, and you see us through him. So we thank you, Lord, for Simon Peter. We thank you, Lord, that he came back. And Lord, may we be encouraged to always do that whenever we stray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.